How you doing? Good. Everyone good? Man, church has been good today. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> Sheesh. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 1. And as you're finding the passage, I just want to tell you a story. I want to tell you something that happened to me. So it was January 1st, 2021. The, the end of 2020. Right, the, the time that many of us thought that all the crazy was going to end. Right? And I'm at my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law's house, and we're hanging out. And uh, we're having fun. It's getting late into the night. And they live in, uh, like, North Rockland. And, and, and this is not a flex, but, like, where they live, like, like, many of the houses in that area aren't even built yet. Right? Like, like, like they are you know, one of a handful of houses that are even inhabitable in that area. And so we're there, we're hanging out, and my, my car has been broken into a few times, so I'm really good at locking the door. I lock it all the time, but maybe my guard was down this day, and maybe because I'm in this quiet and secluded place, I, I don't know what it is, but I didn't lock my door, and so we're in there, we're hanging out, and it's really late, and so now we're, we're getting ready to leave, and so I start taking stuff to the car. And as I walk outside, my trunk is open. And some of the groceries that were in my back uh, trunk were on the ground. And I just thought that it was me. I thought I did it because my keys were in my, my sweater. And so I just thought maybe I hit the button, no big deal. So I pick up everything off the ground. I put it in the car. And so I go back and forth and I load the car up. And we say all of our goodbyes. I go to get into the car. I walk around and I open the driver's side. And all of our stuff that's, that was in our middle consoles and in, in the driver's seat. Our car has been broken into again. But we're looking around and we're like, there's not a whole lot of stuff missing. And, and so we're looking and, and all we can really determine in that moment that's gone is Amy's Motrin. <laughs> and so we're just looking and we're like, man, there's loose change here. There's other medicine that's here. Uh, and, and we've gotten really good at not putting a lot of valuable stuff in our car, but, but I'm looking around like, man, if I'm a thief, I would have probably wanted this and I would have maybe taken that. Like, like what, what happened? And so we just drove home confused and, and we're driving home. We're like, why would someone break into our car and take almost nothing and leave almost everything? The next morning I'm doing my devotional and I start prayer time. And as I'm praying, it comes to mind again what happened. And so I just decided to ask the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, what, what's going on? Like, what happened? And then it dawned on me. There was something else missing. See, Amy and I, uh, we've had our eyes on this hanging lamp at Ikea. Uh, we bought a house, I think, like six months ago. And we just felt like, man, this would be perfect to hang right over our kitchen table. We've got to get it. And we've been dragging our feet. We haven't, you know, pulled pulled the trigger. We haven't done it yet. And so we were at Christmas. We were with our family. We were telling them, Hey, you know, we still haven't got, it. we're going to get this lamp, blah, blah, blah. Well, new year's, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, Justin and Susanna, they bought the lamp for us. And in excitement, I picked the box up immediately and I run outside and I throw it in the truck. And I realized in that moment in prayer, the light is gone. They stole the light. And then the Lord spoke to me. <laughs> now, I, I really don't like it when people say that because it just doesn't happen to me as much as I want it to. But in that moment, I heard the inward audible voice of God. Okay, this is how this works, right? I, like, like, it was like God dropped a thought in my heart in that moment. And this is what he said to me. He said, you know, Satan would love to steal your light this year. He would love to steal your light this year. This was an intentional act because that's all he really needs. That's it. Your lamp is gone and your Motrin is gone. Now, church, just help me for a second. Just help me. Just help me. Just help me. What does Motrin do again for you? It's a pain reliever. And he said, if Satan can steal your light, he can rob from you your ability to relieve the pain of others. If Satan 
can steal your light. He can rob from you your ability to relieve the pain of others. So how's your 2021 going so far? <laughs> Just the weirdest stuff happened. My, my mom, um, I don't even know how much she wants me to share this. But she's hanging out in her apartment. My mom and my aunt, they live together. Uh, they're hanging out in their apartment. Some scuffle happens in the parking lot. Pop, top, 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 top. I mean, this is antelope. I, this is my hometown. This is where I grew up. Top, 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 top. A bullet flies through their window. This week. This week. Antelope. That ain't Rockland. I understand that. But <laughs> Crazy. So last week we began a new series that we've entitled Deleting Destiny. And we, we just feel like it's, you know, a, a time where the church needs to understand, you know, what it looks like to overcome the devil's deception. You know, the Bible says that the, the, the devil seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, and that he uh, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, the devil is our enemy. You have an enemy. He wants to take you out. He wants to take you out. And one of the worst things we can do in war is underestimate our enemy. Amen. Thomas Brooks uh, was a 17th century English Puritan preacher and author. And he wrote a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And in it, he says this, and he's speaking to the believer. He says, Christ, the scriptures, your own hearts, and Satan's devices are the four prime things that should be first and most studied and searched. Okay. We are living in a time where we have access to more information than we've ever had, but we, we, we're also in this time where we are more prone to ingest and recirculate misinformation than we've ever been. Aren't we? And so if there's ever a time where the people of God need to be the called out ones, the truth bearers, uh, it's now. Yeah, I heard this said recently um, that God is, and I believe this wholeheartedly, that God is raising up right now. He is raising up a people who have eyes to see the strength of the enemy. That God is raising up people who can see the supernatural while everyone else sees the superficial. This is what God is doing. The devil is a deceiver and he is pandering anyone who cannot see him for who he truly is. And so we're going to look at nine different areas of deception. Last week, Brandon and Branson, they took a look with us at uh, the first D of digital addiction. Today, I want to give you the second D, which is disturbed. Everyone say disturbed. disturbed. Everyone say disturbed. disturbed. I want to hit a topic that we don't talk about a lot in church. I want to talk about this issue of mental illness. Mental illness is an issue that is so broad yet so profound, and we got to talk about it because the truth is there's a stigma surrounding mental illness. The church uh, has really struggled with this. It's traditionally been in one of two ditches. One ditch is mental illness is a sin, and, and you just need more faith if you're going to get free. All right. The other ditch is mental illness is a mystery, and we don't know how to help you, so we're just going to act like it's not there. But mental illness is becoming more and more common, more and more prevalent. The National Institute of Mental Health says that one in five U.S. adults live with mental illness. One in four families have at least one member on the mental illness spectrum. And, and, and by the way, that's before the pandemic. These are 2019 numbers. Okay? So this is before shelter in place has caused isolation to bring more of this stuff up to the surface. And so we all need to be paying more attention to our own mental health and better support others who are struggling with theirs. Amen? Amen. Amen. Rick Warren is a, a well-known pastor out of L.A. Many of us know who he is, Purpose Driven Life. Um, and if you know him, you may also know that his youngest son, Matthew, committed suicide in 2013 after battling mental illness for 10 years. And in the aftermath of all this, Rick Warren stepped in front of his church, and this is what he said to his church. He said, there's no shame in diabetes. There's no shame in high blood pressure. But why is it that if our brains stop working, there's supposed to be shame in that? Mental illness is an illness. It's not a sin. 
It's not a sin. Someone here at the sound of my voice is suffering from mental, from mental illness and you're suffering in silence. And I'm here to tell you, you can't. You can't. If you're struggling with mental illness in either a chronic way or a temporary way, let me just tell you right now, what you're going through is difficult. It is real. It is profoundly troubling. And let me also tell you that is also one of the reasons why Jesus came. So what I want to do with the time that we have together is I want to unpack the way in which the devil uses mental illness as a pathway to dominate us and to change the way we think about our identity, our purpose, and our destiny. Amen? You guys want to go on the ride? All right. So Mark chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. We're going to read this whole story. So just hang with me. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, into the region of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, not even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and the mountains and cutting himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had already been saying that Jesus had already been saying to him, come out of that man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. Now there was a large herd of pigs feeding nearby on the mountain and the demons begged him saying, send us into the pigs so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Verse 14, their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the countryside. And the people came to see what had happened. And then they came to Jesus, saw the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had previously had the legion and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon possessed man and all about the pigs. And they began to beg him to leave their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had the demon possessed, who was demon possessed, was begging him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him. But he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him for him. And everyone was amazed. Let's pray together. Lord, I'm amazed at how you would, just in reading this story, how you would go to a city for one man. For one man. You would go to a city to restore and heal one man. I thank you, Lord, because it's such a microcosm of what you've done ultimately, Lord, that you left heaven and came to earth. And I thank you, Lord, that though you were rich, you became poor so that through your poverty, we could become rich. Thank you for coming. Lord, I think back to when I gave my life to you, Lord, I was not looking for you. I really wasn't, Lord, and you came. You pursued me. And so, God, in this time that we have together, I ask that you would pursue the hearts of your people. Pursue us, Lord. We thank you. Lord, teach us something in this area of mental illness today. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 So this passage introduces us to a man who seems to be both mentally ill and demon-possessed. Now, let me reiterate. All right? Mental illness is not a sin, but... Sin can exacerbate mental illness. And so we don't know this man's uh, origin story, but what we do know is that at some point he became open to demon possession and, and it was absolutely destroying his life. And so in this one recorded encounter with Jesus, we see both the devil's deception 
in mental illness and Jesus' dominion over it, all right? And so I, I want to show you guys three things as we just look at this story together. Three things. I want to show you his condition, his cry, and his cure, all right? His condition, his cry, and his cure. First, his condition. Jesus comes to this town, and he steps off the boat, and it says, a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, right? This man lived among the tombs. Now, in, Jesus cult, or in, excuse me, in Jewish culture, to, to dwell among the dead meant constant defilement. That there was a stigma on this guy. He couldn't be around people, so he was driven to a solitary place. And let me just start by saying, right away we see the devil's work. Because the devil desires to make our lives such hell that we and other people wish us dead before our time. That's what he wants to do. He wants to isolate you. He wants to put you in lifeless places, a lifeless environment. He wants you all by yourself. This is why right now there's such a full court press in this church about everyone getting involved in Acts 2 communities. And it's not because it's another program that we want to push. That's not it at all. You have got to get connected. If 2020 showed us anything, we have got to get connected. We have to. I mean, it's one of the things that, that God noticed and, and observed right away after he created Adam. I mean, think about this. He created Adam in a paradise. And then God observed Adam. He says, man, man, that wasn't planned. He's alone. It's not good. This man lived among the tombs. Another thing we notice is that he was naked. Uh, Luke chapter 8 uh, records a version of the story as well. And it says in verse 27 that he had not put on clothes for a long time. And so this man was isolated, uh, but he was stripped of his dignity also and out of control. Then it says this man was also unchained. He was out of control and no one could control him. That, that, that's, that's really a great working definition of mental illness, isn't it? That, that you're out of control and no one can control you, isn't it? He is strong physically but weak mentally. And this is more of the devil's currency. Uh, because this man was Superman. He... Uh, he, was, he was the incredible Hulk. They, they couldn't chain him down. As they chained him down, he would constantly break out of the chains. You know, there are over 100 different movies made over the last 100 years that have this, uh, this Faustian bargain, which is to say it's a, it's a character uh, who sells his soul to the devil in order to reap some sort of benefit or reward, but at a costly price. Movies all over. It's, it's just this, this theme. And, and what you see, the prevailing theme and the bait and switch in it all is that the devil will make you strong in areas that don't matter, while the great exchange is making you weak in areas that matter most. You see that over and over and over again. Now you say, Sean, that's just a movie. It's not real. Are you sure? Do you know anyone who's really good at giving you counsel? but has no moral excellence in their own life and they're always tripping over themselves? Do you know those people? Now, some of you aren't smiling. Cause I hope you're not that person. I love you. God bless you. I'm glad you're here. Right? So, strong in advisory, weak in self-mastery. Yeah. Or, or do you know that person who is really, really good at their vocation? Really good at their vocation. Politician. Corporate executive, right? Uh, professional athlete, doctor. But, but then you look at their personal life and their personal life is a wreck because they cannot deal with their interpersonal relationships. You know those people. This man was physically strong but mentally weak. And for that reason, he was worse off. He was, it says, in torment. He was in torment. And his torment was so bad that it also says that he would cut himself. Now, what, what does that mean to us? He would cut himself. Let me tell you what this means. Whatever you seek most in life becomes your Lord. Whatever you seek most in life becomes your Lord. What does Lord mean? Lord means controller. 
Listen, you and I, we do not have control over ourselves. We do. We don't. Whatever you, you care about the most, whatever you're most passionate about, whatever energizes you the most, that's what controls you. And I want to take this further because if you're not dealing with Christ, this is a hot take. Okay? If you're not dealing with Christ, you're dealing with the devil. If Christ is not the most important thing in your life, the devil has you. He has you. He will give you that thing that you have to sell your soul to acquire. And though you care about it, and though you're passionate about it, and though you're energized by it, you will have to give up your freedom. And you will find that you are cutting yourself to get it. Satan's deception is that he wants us all engaging in self-harm. Anything ultimate in our lives that we pursue apart from Jesus will require us to cut ourselves to get it. You know, we look at ancient cultures and we see things that they're doing in that culture, like child sacrifice, right? And we say to ourselves, I would never sacrifice my children. But can I tell you that there are some careers that require you to cut yourself? That, that if you are going to be successful, if you're going to thrive in your career, you are going to have to engage in, in child sacrifice, If you're going to be productive, if you're going to thrive in your position, you're going to have to become strong in an area that doesn't matter and become weak in an area that matters most. Oh, yeah, this man is much further down the road than us. But can I tell you, we're not too far off from him. We're not. This was a man who was isolated. He was out of control, and yet he couldn't be controlled because he had given control over to the devil. And it says he was in torment. And then he speaks. Secondly, his cry. Verse 6 says, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and he bowed down before him. And bowing at Jesus' feet was, was a posture of worship. He runs to him and he bows at his feet, but that's not all. It also says that as he ran and bowed at his feet, at the very same time, he was aggressively yelling at him. <laughs> what do you want? He's yelling at Jesus. This is what mental illness looks like. Yeah. That, that all you want to do is draw near, but all you know how to do is push people away. All you really want is connection, but all you seem to know how to give is rejection. You're wounded, but all you seem to be able to do is wound other people. And this is why we need to run to Jesus. This is why we need to cry out to Jesus. Because if we don't get healed from what, uh, what hurt us, we will continue to bleed on people who didn't cut us. So as this man is running towards Jesus and crying out, Jesus is coming towards him and Jesus is crying out as well. So just imagine this picture, right? This man is, is running, rah, 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 rah. he's yelling at Jesus and Jesus is coming and Jesus is yelling as well. But then this man says something that gets Jesus to stop the exorcism. This is what he says. This man says to Jesus, I implore you by God, do not torment me. This man is being tormented somehow. Uh, and, 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 and in the midst of being tormented, he thought that whatever Jesus could bring into his life would be worse than his current condition. Satan's plan is to crowd us and to cloud us. Uh, Satan wants us to, he wants to convince us that anything that God would bring into our life will make us worse off. Anything that God would, would bring into our lives is in his best interest and not ours. But then Jesus asks him a question. Now, whenever God asks a question in scripture, it's not because we need to educate him. Right? Whenever God asks a person a question in scripture, what you realize is that it is always a revealer of identity uh, and, and it shines light on the human condition. All over scripture, you see this God asking people questions. Adam, where are you? Cain, what have you done? Moses, what's in your hand? Jacob, what's your name? Elijah, what are you doing here? Ezekiel, K, 
can these bones live? Jonah, do you have reason to be angry? Peter, who do men say that I am? Demoniac. Mark chapter 5. What's your name? And he responds, legion, for we are many. Then he begs Jesus not to send them away. See, this man believed he was his condition. He believed that, that his identity was his dysfunction. He was convinced that eliminating the demons would eliminate him. How about you? How about you? Have you been battling mental illness so long that you can't imagine yourself without it? Have you been, been battling it so long that it has become synonymous with your name that when people think about you, they think about your issue? Have you bought into that and have just accepted that? This man didn't want God to send them away. And he comes before the Lord of grace and he says, don't torment me. And really what it takes is a face-to-face -face encounter for him to see that Jesus is not in the tormenting business. I mean, don't, don't you hate being misunderstood? That, doesn't it bother you when you're being misrepresented? All right, isn't it a problem for you when you're misinformed? Isn't it? If you don't run to Jesus, if you don't seek his face, if you don't open his, his word and read it, if you forsake assembling with his people, if you do not say yes to community, if you don't do these things, you are open to the devil's deception. You are. And he is fully committed to giving you a false view of who God is. Amen. So we see his condition. We see his cry. And lastly, his cure. Jesus, you guys all right? It's a, smi a little smile break. <laughs> Jesus casts the demons out and it causes a huge commotion. So much so that many people of the city came out to see what was going on. See, uh, this is why we need to push back against mental illness in ourselves and our, in, in the lives of others. Because every case of mental illness that results in healing, it, it produces a platform for the glory of God. Right. God, God will come for you, but through you, he can save a city. They, they find this man sitting at the feet of the master, a new master and clothed. See, under the devil's control, he will always strip you. He will always leave you naked. He will always exploit you. He will always expose you. While Jesus only wants to wrap us in dignity. Jesus only wants to wrap us in worth and in righteousness. And this man was in his right mind. Seeing uh, all of this, the people are more afraid now of the free man than they are of the possessed man. Hmm. So what do they do? They ask Jesus to leave. With no argument, Jesus capitulates. He gets on the boat, but he tells this man to go back home and tell everyone what the Lord had done for him. The, the, the man goes home to Decapolis. Now, Decapolis was a place that was unapologetically Greek. Right? They, they, were, they were extremely committed to their own gods, their own philosophies, and their way of life. And so they said no to Jesus, but then enters a living, walking, unanswerable demonstration of what Jesus can do in a man. The device and the deception of the devil is to do all he can to make sure that Jesus is misunderstood, to make sure that Jesus is misrepresented. But the undeniable proof of Christianity is a recreated man and woman. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand. We're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, I want to speak to anyone who is suffering from mental illness. And this includes anyone who is suffering because someone you love is suffering. I don't have all the answers. Um, this, this issue is broad. It's, it's complex. 
and you may need to engage psychology and sit with a counselor. You may need to sit down with someone who can talk you through the trauma and the abuse that led you to your illness. You may need to pursue medical treatment. God has gifted physicians to understand our biology and you may need prescribed medicine to aid you in your journey to wholeness. And so I'm not a counselor and I'm not a physician, but I do know the wonderful counselor and the great physician. All right. And Jesus is here right now. You know, uh, John chapter five, Jesus encounters this man who's been suffering from his condition for 38 years, right? And, and in this passage, and the very first time I read it, I just laughed. And in this passage, Jesus encounters him. He stoops down to his level and he says to him, do you want to get well? <laughs> now, if I'm the guy, I'm like, bruh, bruh, look at me. What you think? Why did Jesus say that? Can I tell you why Jesus said that? Because there is absolutely a connection between belief and relief. Jesus is here right now and he can free you. Jesus will respond to your cry. How do I know that? Because when Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying for you and me, his father for our sake didn't respond to his cry. Jesus can break the chains off of you because Jesus broke the chains of sin when he died on the cross. Jesus can deliver you from your tombs. Why? Because he was buried in one and he rose from his. And so right now you have an opportunity to know who you are, why you're here, and what's going to happen to you when you die. Your identity, your purpose, and your destiny. See, Satan would like you to believe that your identity is your dysfunction. Uh, Satan would like you to believe uh, that, that, that your purpose is to, to be lonely. And he wants to isolate you and put, and put you in these lonely places. He wants to put you around death and lifelessness. And he wants you to believe that's your purpose. It's not. That Satan wants to delete your destiny. But let me tell you the truth. You've been made in the image and likeness of God. You are not a mistake. Your purpose is to know him and have a relationship with the God who made you and your destiny is to be in the presence of God who made you and want a relationship with you forever and ever. And right now, it is all yours. If you pray with me. So with all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Lord Jesus, it is really, really hard to love people when I don't love myself. It, it is really, really hard to serve when I feel like I'm trapped in a body, I'm trapped in a mind that does not work optimally. Will you come? Will you come? Church, pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, you have not given me a spirit of fear, but one of power, one of love, and a sound mind. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing me. Lord, change my heart. Heal my heart. Lord, renew my mind. Heal my mind. Forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And I will go and tell the world what you have done for me. In Jesus' name, amen.